Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today's topic is Africa and blockchain, DeFi, NFT, GameFi, SocialFi, and memes. And we have Lucky Yuwakwe with us. He is located in Africa. Hello, Lucky. How are you? Hi, Michel. Thanks for having me on your show again today. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the topic of Africa and DeFi. You're known as the king of DeFi, NFT, GameFi, SocialFi, and everything else. How do you first know of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Okay, interesting. My first knowledge about crypto happens to be some sort of random search, uh-huh. actually. I've always had this interest or keen interest for emerging of new tech. And in the course of just randomly searching, I saw some piece of information about the Cypherphone community. In that regard... And I learned that there was something that was trending already in the Cypherphone community at that time. So I researched a bit, but I didn't take it quite serious. That's the truth. And after the time, I never took it as a serious kind of conversation. Not until when the advent of Silk Road came out, which is quite unfortunate that a lot of persons, I think, also happened to get into crypto utilizing either information or the news around the Silk Road, especially the dark side of the web. So at this time, I learned that there are places where we, we could buy some movies and all those kind of stuff, almost at a cheaper price, some sort of, because it was not a common thing for us to just go to the cinema and watch movies and pay the actual cost. We always want it cheaper. So <laughs> as a way of us looking for here and there kind of a piece of information. So I got to know about crypto from the sci-fi community mm-hmm. as a conversation. And then when I got to read about it, see more information, a Bitcoin talk forum. From there, I started asking questions around what crypto is all about. Another important or changing point for me happens to be when Ross Ulbricht got arrested. All right. Ross Ulbricht, the creator of the, of the Silk Road that got arrested. I saw a lot of his news were flashed on CNN at that time and that ring a bell. And I said to myself, like, I thought this was that thing I was always researching on or what have you. This was like my earliest experience with crypto. And I've, I've, ever since then, I've maintained my throttle or I've maintained my quest and knowledge and my interest in wanting to know more about it. It's quite unfortunate that some of the things that triggered me at that early time happens to come from the story that surrounds Ross Ulbricht. But before Ross Ulbricht, I had heard about it from the Cypherphone community and I did research a little bit more around it from Bitcoin Talk. This was my earliest encounter with crypto and I was, I'm talking about sometimes in 2012. That's early. Let's talk about some of the terminology because I love definition. The title is, again, Africa and blockchain. And, and when we say blockchain, it includes DeFi, NFT, GameFi, SocialFi, and me. What is DeFi? Okay. So DeFi is simply it's an acronym for the word decentralized finance. And from the concept of what it stands for coming from the perspective of blockchain technology, it's simply people having access to financial related services in a decentralized manner where there is no central authority calling one central short. Mm-hmm. Irrespective of your location, the place where you are, you can participate in a global pool of funds and receive the same benefit like any other person in any part of the world. This is just basically what decentralized finance is all about, just as the name implied, uh, being decentralized and there's no central entity. And you can always assess them through utilizing a DAP or decentralized applications like maybe Metamax, Trust Wallet, and all this kind of Web 3.0 technology uh, related solutions. And that's what decentralized finance is about. How about NFT? What is NFT? Okay, so NFT is simply just non fungible token. Interestingly, uh, the concept of NFT, even though it's now a much more hot topic, have always been there long before this time. I remember the 2017 boom of crypto kitties. We we're always talking about a little bit of, uh, around NFTs, but when we saw the, the way the market entered into the winter period, people, a lot of persons did not necessarily see the need to go into it. But thanks again, two, three years later, the concept is now becoming a very hot one. But in relating these definitions in terms of to Africa, I, I think NFTs, uh, I don't know whether to even digress <laughs> into that aspect to just to uh, define them only straight up as a definition. But anyway, it's, it's, it's just simply a non-fungible tokens, meaning a token that has no replica of itself, like something that is identical and uniquely itself, 
There is no any other one. Some other things might be identical to it, but they're not exactly it. Just like people always use the analogy in examples where they say, imagine you have a cat and somehow you travel overseas. Upon returning back, yeah, your white cat is no longer available or it happens to get missing. No matter the amount of white cats they will bring to you, it never equates or explain to the real owner that cat they are bringing to him is exactly as the same cat he had before he traveled overseas. So people want something that is unique. It's just like a, a mother or a parent having a son or a child, irrespective of whatever happened, if the child gets missing, they want their child and they don't want any child that looks like that child. So NFT is as unique as uh, that kind of thing. So anything you know that has its unique properties such that irrespective of how the other things might look like it, they never give the same appeal or the same feel like the original thing. I simply just call them NFTs because that's why it's non-fungible, meaning you can exchange it for something else. Okay, awesome. It's just what it is. Okay, okay so it's a unique identifier to a token. And what is GameFi? Okay, so... Now, the concept of game theory, interestingly, have been a long one. A long one, even from the mention of Satoshi Nakamoto. He did talk a bit around uh, game theories, the Byzantine theories, and all those kind of theories that has to do with solving some type of difficult equations. But game finance have, is now, of course, taking the world by surprise. Not just by surprise, but I think it's more like it's time right now. Uh, everybody who are now seeing the need for mixing leisure and money is now beginning to see that. There is a way to which all these things work. Growing up as kids, remember our parents always want to tell us to be serious with our studies, don't play too much games and all those kind of <laughs> funny stuff they tell us then. But now a lot of those technologies are beginning to change where kids can now see value from, through the same thing that was purely for fun uh, at the initial stage. So GameFi is, uh, is simply a little bit related to decentralized finance, just like a uh, making finance possible or accessible through different kind of game theories or game solutions that are out there. So I, I just want to leave this definition a bit plain and a bit basic so it doesn't get too complicated for a, an average listener. Awesome. And then we have two more definitions. The next one is social mm-hmm. fire. The social fire. Yep. Okay. So the definition of social fire, honestly, as much as I'm still anticipating that social fire have not really picked up, but most of my recent research have shown that People have not yet catch into the euphoria of social fight, but I'm anticipating and predicting that 2022 should be the year for social fight. In case you're listening to me right now, anybody who's listening to this radio, I go grab some social fire related tokens. And I'll use this opportunity to also say a big uh, shout out to my friend, the owner of Max.io. So these are one of the early social fight uh, tokens. But anyway, social fight is a, it's a concept that has to do with experimenting finance with the public. It's a bit different from decentralized finance because, you know, for decentralized finance, it's more like we are pulling resources together and an interest or whether you're lending and all those kind of stuff. But social fire have to do with where the public are giving full autonomy or full power, full control in terms of their finance. In the events that they are living in a repressive country or in a country where they, the regime is a totally tyrant in nature, you are able to take back control of everything you have. Finance from social fire perspective is not just defined as money. It's defined as anything that has to do with your rights, your resources, your privacy, your own freedom. That's exactly what social fire, it's all about in terms of social finance. But most times people always think that social fire is just around finance with the public or or finance with the entire environment. But it's more around freedom. It's more around Finance, but finance is not defined just as money, but defined as your freedom, your privacy, your rights, your privileges to do whatever you want to do. People are now begin to experiment around that. But the concept of social finance, it's very old. I think some of those type of system of government is no longer popular, where we've seen the, an act that has to do with the type of system that was existing at one point in time, I think in Cuba or so where democracy now have, to a large extent, replaced most of this style. But social finance seems to take that concept from that perspective of this system of government. It's not democracy and per se, but rather it, it has to do with where all of us collectively have rights to own equal share of a thing without necessarily being repressed by any government or any authority per se. 
Okay. And then lastly, what does mean do with cryptocurrency or even blockchain? <laughs> okay, that's cool. I think this will be my most interesting part. So the fact that recently, November 7th, last month, we launched a, a new project that have taken the world by surprise. And Africa, of course, is now beginning to come into the entire picture around the meme. But over time, we've always had this concept of meme. But meme is simply joke or assets in a plain term. But it's a joke that started as a result of the concept of you feeling a bit happy or you feeling a bit okay with when you are interacting with other people within the blockchain space and they are all telling you around um, discussion like now it's almost christmas and discussions and in, in, in dinner table will be coming from how much you've made in crypto and how has crypto benefited you and all those kind of stuff but people saw the need whereby in the events that i have not really made much money from crypto at least I can be able to still show my wallet and tell you I have hundreds of millions of units of a token, even though the hundreds of millions is not an equivalent of dollars. A meme is just simply a joke, but joke that has started as a result of uh, people being able to showcase their wallet or portfolio in large units of numbers. But these large numbers do not necessarily reflect dollars. But today, right now, we're now seeing that the definition of meme have gradually changed from just concept of joke to concept of, like I will always say, people sometimes say memes are useless and memes have no value. While this might be true to a large extent, but in modern society like ours right now, I don't think memes are totally useless and they have no value. Why? Because the only aspect of blockchain space that has to do with building the most integral part of our society, which is around human and community, is meme. Meme has always come from the perspective of coming to build society and coming to build community. And the most integral part of any business or product or service out there is when you are able to build a large followers of people, a large uh, group of users who will utilize your products. Therefore, you can confidently say that you have a working solution, at least a group of number of persons. Meme have gradually changed from just being a joke to a type of or an aspect of the blockchain space that has to do with building communities for the sake of just coming together for fun. So Lucky, what is your background? Interestingly, uh, my background is it's like two words apart from, from what I'm currently doing today. But in my first degree, I was purely in the energy sector. I studied petrochemical technology. All right. So, um, of course, I'm coming from a country where oil export is our mainstay uh, in terms of our economy. My country, Nigeria, happens to depend solely on oil and gas. It's most typical for most young persons to study courses in relation to this space. My background initially started from that angle in terms of my first degree. But my other subsequent degree, including my master's degree program and other degree program that I've done across the world, now purely went straight into tech and IT's blockchain, and being one of the early set of students from the University of Nicosia's master's program in Cyprus, that has also shaped me to a large extent. And I also now code, though I've not been coding um, heavily much per se. And beyond it, I also have um, a degree in artificial intelligence, which makes me somebody who's a bit ripe for the world because I'm coming from an energy to IT to AI and blending that all together with business. That puts me on the right stage for any set of environment that I find myself, per se. What kind of crypto project are you involved in? So I've been involved in a lot of crypto projects, at least since 2015, when my interest became much more bigger, larger. Compared to the year before that, I was just dilly-dallying, like I wasn't taking it too seriously. I've been involved in a lot of different projects, honestly, that I've almost lost count. But in recent time, I'm involved in two most recent projects that I'm currently involved in. Interestingly, is a meme coin, the Wakanda Inu, which I was, I'm also part of the co-founding team of Wakanda Inu. And it's a meme coin that is trying to build a far much more better solution in comparison to what Dogecoin have out there. That's one of my most recent projects. And another most recent project that I'm now involved in is called Store. Store is a decentralized blockchain project that is focused on helping to keep us to distribute securely all data that are coming off from the, the W3.0. All right. We believe already, we already know that this is now the time for Web 3.0. 
but more and more data are now being generated as a result of NFTs, Metaverse, DeFi, GameFi, SocialFi. Almost everybody right now is now looking for a blockchain-related solutions for their business. But the challenge with this new type of test that is now coming out there, even businesses that might not necessarily need blockchain because of the fact that everybody's now talking blockchain, they now want to just build a blockchain solution. But it's coming up with one challenge. And the challenge for this, for Web 3.0 that I'm seeing is there'll be a lot of too much data that will now have challenge as to where are we going to store more of these data. Day in, day out, more data has now been generated. The NFT is is churning out large amounts of transaction data on a day-to-day basis, even for the most things that some persons might consider silly. But if we really want to enhance the growth of Web 3.0, We cannot continue to depend on Google and Amazon to store those data for us. My most recent project right now, apart from Wakanda, you know, which was launched last month, November 7th, is decentralized storage project called Store. And we're trying to build exactly the best or the right type of solutions for cloud storage in a distributed and decentralized manner, utilizing blockchain. We are more like competing with the likes of Sierra Coin, Filecoin, Airweaves, storage and made safe. These are other decentralized projects that are currently out there, but we believe that what we will build right now would be so huge. Though we've not gone public, but we'll be going public sometimes in December. These are my most two recent projects right now. And of course, standard protocol before that, but that was like early in the year. Awesome. And then I wanted to ask you, since the topic is about Africa and blockchain, what is the current state of blockchain in Africa? For the African continent, I can tell you for a fact that everybody, every young person we have out there, like I will always say, Africa have the numbers for the fact that the youngest population density of any continent in this world right now are primarily domiciled in Africa. And every young person we see out there between the ages of, let's say, 15 to about 45 are currently now beginning to look at how they can take advantage of this industry of blockchain. It's more like it's game on for us in the continent of Africa. And that trend or trajectory is not changing anytime soon. Everybody is now beginning to look out for how can they tap into the potentials for this space. Though there is a large concentration of people who have focused more on the crypto-related trading aspect of it. And that might become obvious because of the fact that Crypto trading has to do with money and everybody wants to, of course, go where the money is. But our perspective of young businesses, from the perspective of startups, from the perspective of governments, regulators, and all those kind of category of people or sectors, we don't have this quote and unquote sort of consensus right now that is out there where everybody just wants to take advantage of what blockchain has to offer, whether it's coming from the aspect of cheaper storage or whether it's coming from the aspect of resources being available, whether it's coming from the aspect of it is more secure and transparent. Everybody right now in Africa is looking at that. From my own viewpoint, from the perspective, from what Africa is right now in terms of our understanding for blockchain is that we're looking at it a long term and so many countries in Africa will continue to adopt this technology for the fact that transparency and the effectiveness in terms of is cheaper when you look at it on the long run in comparison to traditional systems we have today. What is your vision for Africa in five years in regards to the technology and how it could change Africa? My vision for Africa within the next five years is that people will be able to adopt this technology on a very large scale. Africans will be able to build the solutions that will compete effectively well with the rest of the world. So it's no longer a case of where an African is building a product and this product cannot compete effectively well with other products, similar products from other continents. And lastly, just to help, is that Africa is the right place and the most easiest place to implement the solutions, the service of blockchain technology in comparison to other continents where they have a working system. For example, if I'm living in the United States of America right now, I have no worry around certain basic humanity. I might not have much worry around transparency in terms of system. I might not have much worry in terms of cheaper remittance fees. I might not have much worry in terms of how 
effectively, people are connected in terms of basic access to some of those basic amenities like healthcare and all those kind of things. But blockchain technology is now a technology that people can utilize almost across all board, whether it's from remittance or whether providing uh, transparency to, to data or record keeping. It is much easier to come and implement this technology for Africa because we don't necessarily have some of these things to a large extent across all looks and crowning of the continent in comparison to a nation like America that already have these type of solutions or almost an alternative solutions, what blockchain would have offered. America implementing blockchain means they have to almost scrap out everything they, they built over the years. And these things are already actually working. All right. In comparison to Africa, that don't necessarily have these type of solutions. It's more like very easy. It's easier to build a new house than to destroy a house and build it again from scratch. Awesome. And what are some of the challenges facing Africa today that you think would deter blockchain from changing and reshaping it in a way? And how, do, how would we overcome those challenges? I see that one of the challenges that is facing the continent of Africa in terms of us being able to adopt this technology is I'm very concerned around the type of people who make law for us in the continent of Africa. While I'm not necessarily the type of person who likes to put blame on governments, I always think that people also have a duty to play, especially where if a government, if an appointed official is not doing right, we have a duty to call them out and we have a duty to also ensure that they do it right as citizens. But some of the things that might hinder us as a continent is the fact that the people who find their way up to that top of governance or up to that place that has to do with the political class happen to be, be a set of people that, are, that become so comfortable in their shell or they become so comfortable that they see no need why they need to adopt a technology that will improve the life of people who are complaining. It's more like saying, if I'm the president of my country and I'm, I'm having access to virtually every basic amenities. Why do I need to worry around record keeping and data keeping for a healthcare system? When I know as a politician, I can easily fly myself to the next available country that have an efficient record keeping or an efficient healthcare system. So if there's anything that might impede the growth or adoptions for blockchain technology in the continent of Africa, I think the people who have been given responsibilities to make laws might slow us down. And they will slow us down because of the fact that they've chose not, they've become too comfortable where they are, that they see no reason why they need to update themselves, their mind and their knowledge in what this technology is doing, not just for one individual, but for the entire continent. This is one. The second thing that might impede the growth of the adoption of blockchain technology is if more and more of the use cases for this technology are now being utilized for a venture that has to do with uh, giving dividends of value to crime-related industry. If I'm adopting blockchain technology for remittances, and there is always a continuous complaint by people saying that every time they try to convert their crypto assets back to cash as a result of inflow from remittance, they are either being swindled or they are either being robbed and all those kind of things. This might, of course, limit adoption. And for me, the final part is our level of education. I think a lot of persons are pretty comfortable with understanding that Bitcoin rise and fall in price, but they are not willing to dedicate the time that it takes to learn and understand that the technology of blockchain surpass just price actions for one cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. The average person on the streets or the average person in Africa right now who have not crossed the level of an enthusiast, they're just comfortable with just discussing blockchain from the perspective of crypto and not just crypto, but from the perspective of price actions for crypto. These, for me, are not too healthy if we really want to adopt the technology for the continent of Africa. And unless there is more awareness and education for the people of Africa around this area, and unless regulators are able to update themselves with the most current trend, and also on unless we can be able to show through the solutions we build in Africa that blockchain technology can fix some of the problems that our legacy systems are currently facing. This way, I can be pretty comfortable to say that the, the things that will limit the adoptions for blockchain technology in the continent of Africa can now become a thing of the past. And is there anything else you want to share that I have not asked you? I think it's time for virtually all the continent of Africa to have a mandatory 4IR roadmap. I believe that progressive nations in the West, in China, 
in Singapore, in South Korea, they all have a roadmap as regards to the race for fourth industrial revolution technologies. Whether it is blockchain, whether it is AI, whether it is virtual augmented reality, metaverse, and all those kind of 4IR related um, technology. I would use this medium or this opportunity to call on the 54 presidents of the 54 countries in Africa or the 54 leaders who one way or the other represent each and every individual in the continent of Africa in African Union. That it is time for us to have a mandatory roadmap for fourth industrial revolution technology. We must key in. We must not sit down and play this blame game. We must not sit down and play this redundant attitude of waiting to say, have this technology been implemented anywhere else? You know, there is this common saying in Africa where you tell them about a new invention, a new solution. The first question they ask you is, have the other people tried it? They're waiting for when America will say, we are now utilizing this technology before they can now confidently say it's okay. As strange as it might sound to a lot of persons, you realize that some of the earliest or some of the key people who are contributing greatly to the development of the lighting network of Bitcoin that powers the lighting network of Bitcoin, which is built or powered by blockchain technology. The guy who's behind the CTO, who's the brain behind the lighting network, is a Nigerian, he's an African, as strange as it may sound. Ross Beef is his name on Twitter. A guy who's building the solutions that is powering the lighting network of, of blockchain, coming from a continent that happens not to have adopted or put out a clear roadmap for fourth industrial revolution technologies. It's quite a, a pathetic one, if you ask me. If there is anything I would say to um, the leaders or that I feel that I've not been covered here is that Africa needs to have a roadmap and not just a roadmap, but a roadmap for fourth industrial revolution technologies, blockchain inclusive and all the rest, including AI and all what you have within the 4IR. Awesome. People can find me on Twitter at LUO2027. LUO2027 is where you can find me on Twitter. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Lucky Walkway. And you can also find me on Telegram at LUO2027. See, same handle. So it's super easy. I, that's the year I become the governor of my state. <laughs> in 2027. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you, Lucky, for your time. Awesome to speak with you. Thank you. And blockchain. And I'm looking Thank forward to seeing your vision actuate in, in real life. And so Abs much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. So it's it's a pleasure to be in your, st your studio again. Thank you.